Good morning, church. Welcome to God's house. Welcome to worship this morning. Welcome to all of you who have joined us in the sanctuary. Welcome to those of you who are continuing to watch us on the live stream. We're blessed by your presence both in the sanctuary and watching us online today. We serve a risen Savior who's in the world today. Amen? We're glad that you're all worshiping with us this morning. And we opened our service this morning by reading responsibly. You can find the words in your worship handout. If you're watching us online, the words will appear on your screen or on the online resource guide for you. Reading together, Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, Alleluia. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has given us new life and hope. He has raised Jesus from the dead. God has claimed us as his own. He has brought us out of darkness. He has made us light to the world. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Stand and join me as we open our worship by singing together when morning gilds the skies. Join us as we sing. How much fun is this? We've got 50 people in the room and we are on our way. Worship feels so much different when people are here and we welcome those of you who are watching online but we're also nearing the day when we can have more and more of us here in this room. Wherever you are today, I hope you'll join me as we pray together. Well, God, we've gathered, and hopefully not by habit, but in hope, praying that this hour you might change us, inspire us, comfort us, mobilize us, wherever we need to be met by your grace and good news, we pray that you would meet us now. Change us by the power of your Holy Spirit so that we might be more motivated to be active carriers of your grace in the world. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Reading from the Psalms together this morning. It's a psalm that many of you have committed to memory. 
and many of you have it committed to memory in the version that we're going to read together. I invite you to join me as we share together and rejoice in God's word, reading together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, boys and girls who are worshiping with us at home, good morning. Why don't you come a little closer to the screen so it'll feel more like you're here with me in the sanctuary. And to my friends who are worshiping here in the sanctuary, why don't you give me a thumbs up so I know you're ready for the children's sermon. Awesome. Well, today we just read one of the most famous scripture passages in the Bible, Psalm 23. Most of us know that one really well because it's really important. It tells us that the Lord is our shepherd. Well, you know, I like this sheep a lot. It's my favorite stuffed animal that the church owns. And so I brought it here today for worship for the children's sermon because it reminds me that God takes care of us, his sheep. We are the sheep, and God, through Jesus Christ, is our shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. In fact, Jesus told a story in the New Testament about how one sheep out of a hundred got lost. And the shepherd went and found that one sheep. The shepherd would leave the 99 and go to find the one who was lost because the shepherd loves all the sheep. That reminds me of how Jesus loves us. Jesus loves each one of us. Jesus cares for us and guides us because he is the good shepherd and we are like his sheep. And if you've ever seen a lot of sheep, sometimes sheep do silly things. For many years I lived in India and we would watch sheep and goats do a lot of crazy things. And their shepherds would have to go and rescue them and bring them down when they climbed up into a tree or up into a high mountain peak. The shepherds were always taking care of the sheep and guiding them so that they wouldn't be in danger. Jesus does that for us. He's the good shepherd and he will guide us well. We can always trust him that he will come to our rescue and guide us back to safety when we've gone astray. I'm thankful that Jesus is our good shepherd. Let's pray and thank God for that. Dear God, thank you so much that you are our shepherd that we do not have to worry or fear or want because in you we lack nothing. Thank you for sending Jesus, our good shepherd, to guide us and to teach us and to show us the way home. Lord, thank you for seeking us when we go astray. Thank you for bringing us back into the flock. Lord, we love you. Help us to listen to you and follow your voice. In the name of Christ, the Good Shepherd, I pray. Amen.
my God when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the broad Feel the gentle breeze and sings my soul. How great thou art! And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in. That on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take. of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in a humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, O Lord my God, O Lord my God. Oh!
together. Join me as we pray together. Our Father and our God, once again we come to praise you and to thank you. You lead us as a shepherd leads. We need your leading because without it we wander without any direction but the direction of our own selfishness, our own pride, our own rebellion. Draw us back to the purpose for which you created us. For your goodness, we were born into this world. By your grace, we have been kept all the day long, even to this very hour. And by your love, your unending love, which is fully revealed in the face of Jesus, we are being redeemed. We love to proclaim that, Father. Give us the mind of Christ with each new and passing day. Teach us to know the truth that sets us free, free to honor you and to enjoy you now and forever. For it's in your son's precious name that we pray, the name of Jesus, our Jesus. Amen. As we prepare to receive God's word, I invite you to turn to your sheets and join us as we sing together. Take thou our minds, dear Lord, the first verse only. A couple of words of introduction before I read the scripture today. First, a reminder that we are inside a seven week series uh, listening to the stories of Acts and the formation of the church. We're, we're watching the earliest Jesus followers try to figure out uh, how it is that they're going to organize their witness and become the church. And, and we take some comfort in it because it's full of stories of start and stumble and church fights and misunderstanding and who to include and what's our mission statement and our organizing principles, all of the stuff we're familiar with. So I guess we take a little comfort in their stumbling, but, but more than that, we, we get to see how many times because of the leadership of the Holy Spirit, they get it right. Their principles, their values endure, and these have shaped the church ever since. So, in, in the way, as, like in this country, the way we think about the Constitution as a kind of place to return to get back to the core values, in the church, we look to Acts. We, we go back and look at their core values, the, the founding principles of our life together. So, we're here today in chapter 4. Now, the preaching during this series is not sequential. My, my first sermon was from chapter 4. I think my last sermon will be from chapter 2. 
But today's scripture that I'm about to read does follow after last week's story. Remember last Sunday there was a lame man healed at the beautiful gate. It drew quite a crowd. Peter preached and then we left off the reading. But here's what's happened in between. When, when Peter preached and it caused this big ado, Peter and John ended up getting thrown in prison over it. They'd stirred up a bunch of trouble. So today's reading is what's next. It's, it's the next morning after they were thrown in jail. It's the pretrial hearing related to the havoc these two have created within the temple community. So here we are, chapter 4, beginning in verse 5. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we're questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Well, I'm going to let you all in behind the curtain a moment of preacher talk. So every now and then the pastors get together. I'm, I'm, I'm meeting with two of my buddies this Tuesday night for dinner. And mostly what we do is we found a safe place to talk about you, really, is what we do. But but one of the themes that keeps coming up over and over and over when the pastors gaggle with each other are weddings and funerals. It's the source of our best stories, and most of them we can't tell in church, so we can just tell them to each other. First of all, weddings and funerals are the place where all of the hidden family drama can't be hidden anymore because they're all there. The crazy uncle is going to show up. So is daddy's new wife. So all of these events are just fraught with danger. Then in both cases, everybody has become a professional event planner. I will save my Pinterest rant for another time. But everybody has an idea about how a wedding or funeral should be conducted. And we're not getting a lot of help from the funeral homes. Have y'all seen the commercial? It's not on much anymore, but it used to be on a lot, where the guy drives a motorcycle into the chapel of the funeral home. And the implication there is, if the deceased was in the motorcycles and you want to have a funeral with a motorcycle all up around the casket, whatever, we'll do it, whatever. So in some cases the funeral business have become party planners. We're just here to do what you want. Well, as you might imagine, some people have now brought those expectations into the church and this sanctuary. And, and so I end up being the one who has to play the heavy around all of the suggestions of what they want to do in their service. I'm the one who has to say, no, I'm sorry, one of the bridesmaids can't sing your favorite Shania Twain song in the service. <laughs> no, we cannot recess the funeral to the Georgia fight song. 
I'm sorry, I know that, that you saw this done at your roommate's brother's funeral, but we're not going to do it in the sanctuary of Second Ponds. In some cases, folks get fed up with me and move the funeral to a funeral home so they can set up daddy's gun collection and deer heads up next to the casket or whatever. Well, the sanctuary is a holy place. We hold worship services here. Weddings are worship services. Funerals are worship services. You can sing Danny Boy at the reception. But we're not doing it between the invocation and benediction. So it's, it's become my job to become the one who preserves the sacred components of our worship tradition, and it's not always welcome. And so, I enter into this text, I give you that background to tell you that I'm entering into this text with a great deal of sympathy toward the religious leaders in today's story. Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all were, who were of the high priestly family because they are the ones who have the responsibility to be keepers of the sacred traditions of the faith. And the stability of the temple is being threatened by a fringe group within Judaism who are insisting that a carpenter's son from Nazareth is the Christ, the long-awaited Messiah. And now they're becoming anything but a fringe group. Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 joined their movement. And then yesterday, a man who'd been lame since birth is healed at the beautiful gate. These two men claim that he had been healed by the power of the name of Jesus. A crowd gathers, Peter preaches again, and 5,000 more people come to be followers of the way, as they called themselves then. So Peter and John placed in prison until the religious figures, the, the, the keepers of the tradition, can figure out how to respond to these threats that are happening inside the temple community. Remember, I mentioned this last week, that this isn't a standoff between Christianity and Judaism. Christianity as a religion doesn't exist yet. This, this is all happening within the family. They're all Jews. And they're brought into this circle of Jewish leaders to account for the havoc that they've been creating. So, so, so picture a kind of semicircle, long robes, long beards, crossed off. By what power or what name did you do this? And don't, don't miss the way the question is framed. This is about power. Well, one thing we've learned about Peter is anytime he thinks there's a congregation gathered, he's going to preach, right? Now, gaggle of temple leaders isn't a big congregation, but it's big enough. He'll preach anyway. So Peter lets go and says, rulers of the people and elders, if we're questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick, you ask how this man's been healed, let it be known to all of you and the people of Israel, this man is standing before you in good health in the name of Jesus Christ. Once again, Peter declares that he and John are not the ones who've healed. Jesus is the one who is breaking through with this new expression of God's love and salvation. Now, Peter and John are not anti-temple, so catch that. I mean, they're, they're not part of the spiritual but not religious crowd. These are faithful, institutional supporting Jews. Remember yesterday's miracle, the healing of the man lame, happened when they were on their way to the temple. 
These are the faithful temple goers. In fact, Acts chapter 2, talking about the habits of these early Christ followers, said, day by day as they spent much time together in the temple. You see, these, these folks are not standing outside of the temple and its leadership. They're standing inside saying, God is doing a new thing. The Holy Spirit is blowing fresh winds in here. God raised Jesus from the dead. Messiah is with us. Salvation has come for all. And the temple leaders, you remember I'm sympathetic. They're good people, faithful servants of God, preservers of the sacred tradition. But there's this new thing that's happening inside the tradition. The blind see, the lame walk, the dead carpenter's son was raised by the power of God. Liberation has come to all people. There is something new and wonderful happening inside the tradition. And the temple leaders ask, by what power? But they know something's up. Because everywhere they look, they see this power that they're questioning, and they see that it's turned loose all over the place. 3,000 believers, lame man dancing in the temple courtyard, another 5,000 believers. The power of what God is doing is so evident, but it is a challenge to the institution. To their credit, when Peter preached, they finally did uncross their arms. We didn't read this part of the story, but later in the story, they let Peter and John go, no charges. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. When they saw the man who had been cured standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So they let him go. But you see the tension. We've got this challenge to the institution but a man has been healed. What, what do we do? Well, today, in Atlanta, you know that young people are staying away from the church in droves. In too many instances, the church of Jesus Christ that started in this fire of Pentecost in this bold confrontation to power, in this insistence that people get healed in Jesus' name, somehow some of the fire has gone and some people have started to rule us, us irrelevant. We're being accused of living for institutional preservation rather than healing those at the temple gate. Shootings and race riots and capital mob. A larger culture is wondering why the church isn't leading. This past Monday, our deacons affirmed a statement that Second Postelian Baptist Church continue and expand the altogether ministry of our church as a way of, and I'm quoting here from the motion, expanding our church's legacy of making Christ known to current and future generations as a welcoming and engaged community of faith, making disciples of all nations. In other words, we are more committed than ever that Second Ponce be a leading voice in racial reconciliation in our city. We're poised for this work. 
to be agents of healing in this important conversation in Atlanta. But let's not be naive. When a lame man walks, the institution is challenged. When God's Spirit blows in new directions, it challenges the institution. I have a book in my library that tells the story of Mercer University's uh, integration in the 19, late 50s, I think. Anyway, Mercer was the first private school in the South to voluntarily integrate. An African convert by the name of Sam Oney came as a freshman to Mercer. He had come to know Christ because of the efforts of Baptist missionaries in his country. He enrolled in Mercer, first person of color, and then on a Sunday he got dressed up and went to the nearest Baptist church, and he was not admitted for worship. In the book that I mentioned, there's a picture of him dressed, standing on the steps, two white deacons at the door, defiant. He was not welcome. They were preserving the institution. By the way, it probably goes without saying, but both of the deacons were male uh, you know, institutional preservation and all that. But the Holy Spirit is unruly. And in the name of Jesus, the lame are made to walk. Now you know that Second Ponce is not unblemished here either. We have some shameful chapters of institutional preservation mixed in with our most noble chapters. But going forward, how do we open up the windows of the church in such a way that it allows for God's Spirit to blow in and push us into new directions of God's moving? How do we honor our past and not be constrained by it? By the way, I'm still not letting you bring a Rod Stewart CD for your wedding. But where do we need to be listening and moving in new directions because God's Spirit is doing a new thing? As I said, when Peter preached that day, the, the, the leaders of the temple were just kind of left flat-footed. I mean, they, they couldn't argue. There's a man standing there who just days before had twisted, crippled feet. And then yesterday, by the power of Jesus' name, he danced. And the leaders let Peter and John go. But I also didn't read this part either. They said, as they let him go, what will we do with them? For it is obvious to all who live in Jerusalem that a notable sign has been done th through them. We can't deny it. But then the institutional part of them kicked in and they ordered Peter and John not to speak of it. You know, it's, it stirs up trouble, you know. You see, we, we see a, a man got set free, but shh. And Peter and John said, we cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard. Once we know where Jesus is heading, making the lame walk, liberating the oppressed, healing the blind, binding evil spirits, awakening the divine image in all of humanity, once we know where Jesus' love is taking us, we can't not talk about what we've seen and heard. It, it might challenge the institution. But if we know where Jesus is heading, then we've got to go out and speak in the name of Jesus so that the broken might be healed in his name. Thanks be to God.
We were blessed to read the words of Psalm 23 earlier in our service as we end our service this morning. Let's sing those words together standing as we sing, The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. Three reminders before we leave. First, today is our quarterly church in conference, 1215. If you're watching uh, on television or on your screen, take a quick break, click on, be a part of the Zoom at 1215. If you're in the room, just take it easy for a little while and we're gonna set up some uh, screens and all of that and get ready. Uh, and we'll conduct that business in here because of the technology. The good news is you should be through in plenty of time to get home for the four o'clock altogether service, which will be on your computer screen then. And then at 645 on Wednesday night, we'll all see each other on a Zoom for the next installment of Alex McDonald's terrific study of the Gospel of Mark. But now, go and be bold enough to follow love wherever it takes you. Go and take part in God's project to reclaim the world through loving action. And go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm Chelsea and I'm a part of the All Together service. I just wanted to welcome you guys today. It's going to be a great day. We're going to have some great worship. Feel free to worship at home. Um, I'm going to pray for us today. I'm just going to pray that 
been a good week, and if it even hasn't, that we're able to continue to hope in God and know that we have God's wisdom on our side and that we continue to seek that. Um, I just want to welcome any students that might be graduating soon and just to let you know that uh, we have a church here for you if you're looking for a home church after you graduate. And we also have our college ministry and our all together space. So I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, I just come to you today asking for health and safety and happiness over everyone joining us today. Um, Lord, I pray that we're just able to hold on to your wisdom and know that you are watching us and that whatever is on our mind is in your heart and that you know exactly what you have planned for us. And I just pray that everyone watching knows that us as a community are here for them as well. In your name I pray, amen. God, we put our trust in you, for you are indeed a firm foundation. On Christ the solid rock I stand. 
all of the ground is sinking sand.
I hope this series has blessed you because I think of wisdom totally different now. We've camped out in Proverbs over the past weeks in this month, and man, it has blown my mind. I pray it has blown your mind in a great way about just the effects of wisdom, how Christ is our wisdom, and just how wisdom can transform our lives for the better. Well, today, I wanna take you on a voyage as we speak today about the combination to the lock of life. From Proverbs chapter two. And so, I want you to understand from the jump, combination locks can be amazing and frustrating all at the same time. See, if we rewind my life and you get to laugh at it in middle and high school, I remember having a combination lock on all of my lockers each year. However, I could never remember the combination and I would always be thankful for either the written down combination in my wallet or I would have put it under the contacts in my cell phone. <laughs> because without having the combination and being reminded of it, I probably never would have gotten my belongings from inside of that locker. You see, however, having the combination is only half the battle. See, you had to know when to turn the lock left and then when to turn the lock right, when to go past the assigned number, and then when to go directly right to the assigned number just to get the combination unlocked. As tedious, frustrating, and careful as remembering the instructions to a combination lock can be, many of us compare this feeling to our individual lives. We often wonder, what is the meaning of life? Have you ever answered that question? We wanna know what is our purpose? And are we on the right path to reach our God-given potential? And so I stand today in the Second Punch Library because many of us often believe that if we read a thousand books or more, we'll have knowledge and we'll be ready and life will be great and all will be well. And do you need to read? Yes, but finding the answers to the big questions that I just posed to you can often feel frustrating. It can feel tedious, it can feel careful, it can feel stressful and strikingly similar to that of navigating a combination log. But be encouraged friends, because you have to learn to give yourself grace because Howard Thurman once told us he encourages us Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. So today, we do just that. We take the idea of a combination lock along with what makes us come alive and we blend it together with great wisdom found in Proverbs chapter two. You see this proverb is between a son and a father. And the father speaks to his son in such a loving but truthful manner, showing the son that the combination lock of life can only be unlocked by wisdom. Wisdom given to creation by God. So just like the old cheer that the cheerleaders used to say at different basketball games and sporting events, I'm gonna ask for you to stop, to look, and to listen to what this father has to say in Proverbs 2, beginning in verse one. The father says, my child, if you accept my words and treasure up my commandments within you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, if you indeed cry out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk blamelessly, guarding the paths of justice and preserving the way of his faithful ones. You see, the combination that unlocks the lock of life and unlocks the answers to our greatest and biggest and gigantic questions is that of wisdom. But wisdom, it's quite specific as we talked about last week. Here's the thing about wisdom. Wisdom helps us maneuver properly our greatest temptations. Mm -hmm. You see, this proverb is all about 
temptations that the son in this proverb is facing. He's facing the temptation of leaning towards violence, but also the temptation of being led by his sexual desires. You see, and his father is attempting to offer him very key wisdom that can unlock his potential. He also is attempting to offer his son wisdom that will help him properly navigate and maneuver these two temptations of violence and his sexual desires. This is why the father says, seek wisdom more than you seek silver or gold. Search for it all the time. And then he points his son to God. Why, you may ask, because God is the maker and the deliverer and the crafter of wisdom for life. Friends, think about it just like this. Just like we have clothes for all seasons of life, God has specific wisdom for every situation of life. You see, think about it. Your pain, your heartbreak, loneliness, betrayal, uncertainty, or the feeling of being lost, God has wisdom to help us properly navigate it all. Maybe you feel like giving up. Maybe you believe that no one cares. You probably may feel like you are undervalued. But if you don't even know how long you can make it, God has wisdom for it all. See, what we feel in moments has the propensity to tempt us into thinking that that moment will last an entire lifetime. And that's not true. Think about this. See, when pain arrives in our lives, we're very tempted to do whatever we have to do for that pain to cease. See, this temptation here means that we'll do things that are moral, things that are immoral, things that are right, things that are wrong. Why? Because we just want pain that's happening in the moment to stop. Friends, this father is saying to us as well as his son, please don't make the mistake by allowing your temptations to lead you. Don't make your temptations your God. You see, seek the wisdom of God and God will reveal to you how to maneuver properly the temptations that you're faced with. So I ask you today, in this library filled with the wisdom of books, this son was tempted by violence and his own sexual desires. But what at this moment is tempting you? Maybe as you look out into the world currently, you possibly find yourself maybe flirting with hopelessness. Could it be that you're tempted to believe due to being undervalued by others that you find yourself tempted to believe that God does not care about you? Friends, whatever your temptation may be, I stopped by to tell you, Today, do not rely on your own understanding, but seek the wisdom of God. Allow God to guide you, to lead you, and to steer you, not your temptation. See, the combination lock to the lock of life, the combination to the lock of life is wisdom. And wisdom helps us to deal with our temptations, but what else does wisdom do? I'm glad you asked. It's right here in chapter 2 of Proverbs, verses 9 through 15, where we see this father continue his good conversation with his son. He says that then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Prudence will watch over you and understanding will guard you. It will save you from the way of the evil, from those who speak perversely, who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil, those whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. See, once we unlock the combination lock with wisdom, these verses teach us that gaining wisdom is a constant process. See, acquiring wisdom is more than knowledge. It's more than just reading books about a thing, but it in fact is knowledge applied. And it is in fact when one becomes what they have learned and what they are learning. See, this is why Paul told us in the Bible that we need to let the same mind that was in Christ be in us. It's also why Paul said in the Bible, hey, you all imitate me 
as I imitate Christ, because his hope was that everything that we learn about Jesus, that we would become. No, no, no. I'm not telling you that you need to, you will be divine or reach some stage of being divine. No, but we can take on Jesus's morals. We can care about the left out and the unnoticed, and we can make what is our hobby, our habit and make our habit our norm. But maybe you still wrestle with this thought about how gaining wisdom can be a constant process. So let me take it off the top shelf for you. I want to give you four steps that will assist you in properly gaining wisdom. Here's the first step. The first step is this. You have to learn to trust God continually. You cannot trust God only part time, only when you feel like it or only when you are blessed, no stress with lots of happiness. You got to learn how to trust God continually, even when life is not good. Secondly, you got to learn how to read the Bible often. Oftentimes we're skeptical of God and we like to believe things about God that society may say about God, but we don't even know it's true because we've never read God's word continually. Trust God, read the Bible often, but thirdly, apply God's specific wisdom to every area of our lives. So when God gives you wisdom, don't say, hey man, I don't like that, I'm gonna put it back on the rack like it's some ugly shirt at a department store. But when God gives you wisdom, apply it immediately. But lastly, allow the experience of making mistakes to be lessons that we learn from. Don't allow mistakes to hinder you from your destiny but allow mistakes to propel you toward God and to the purpose that God has for you. See, this process of trusting God, reading the Bible often, applying God's wisdom, allowing our mistakes to lead us and learn from and get us forward, this is the continual process that we must commit to over and over again. Because as we open our heart to the wisdom of God, we form the habit of living lives that honor God. See, as we learn the wisdom of God, God's wisdom saturates our decision making. It affects our speech. It affects how we form community. It affects the morals that we exhibit and even the way we handle temptation and challenges. Understand today that unlocking the combination lock of life with wisdom is not a get out of problem free card. Don't we wish? I wish it was like Monopoly where we would say, hope we got the wisdom from God. Thank you. Life is great. No, it doesn't work like that. This godly wisdom helps us to be in the presence of evilness and wickedness in the world. And either God will equip us to wisely speak up and fight for change or in the presence of evilness and wickedness in the world, God has the power to save us from the wickedness and the evilness altogether. You see, this father in wisdom in Proverbs chapter two is telling his son and us that there is no need to ever believe that violence will have the final say. I mean, sure, we can look at the world right now and notice justice not being served. We can even notice hatred winning moments. But our hope given to us by Jesus reminds us that God is great wise and powerful. We're reminded that hatred may win a quarter and justice could even win a half, but neither will win the game. You see, believers in God and the wisdom God gives, we live in great hope. We live in hope that what is crooked will be made straight. We live in hope that what is wrong will be made right. We live in hope that what is unbalanced will become balanced. And although I know it is tempting to give into momentary temptation, Proverbs 2 tells us, hold up, wait a minute, and ask, God, this situation is above me. How do I handle it? Hmm. When is the last time, friends, that you've ever been that open to God, where you were able to admit your weakness to God and ask God for God's wisdom? Friends, if you got to think longer than 20 seconds, don't think, but do. Try admitting your weakness to God about a given life situation and ask God for God's wisdom. Friends, we've seen 
that wisdom is specific and it can help us navigate our temptations. We've noticed that we have to commit to a constant process of gaining wisdom by reading the Bible, learning from our mistakes and, you know, all of what I named before, but yet I hope you're ready because we're about to go all the way in deep water. We are about to come face to face with what temptation looks like in verses 16 through 22 of Proverbs 2. So again, just like the cheerleaders will say, stop, look, and listen with me. His father tells his son, you will be saved from the loose woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the partner of her youth and forgets her sacred covenant. For her ways lead down to death and her paths to the shades. Those who go to her, they don't never come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. Therefore, walk in the way of the good and keep to the paths of the just. For the upright will abide in the land and the innocent will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. Friends, within these verses, we notice exactly what temptation looks like. Temptation comes at three o'clock in the morning when you could wait for breakfast, but you get a three o'clock snack like me. Hmm. Temptation comes when it's so alluring to take a shortcut instead of study. Hmm. Temptation looks like pridefulness. It looks like sexual desires. It looks like the grass is greener, but those are just weeds. Hmm. See, within Proverbs chapter two, what we notice is that this son has two very big temptations coming at him at the moment. And as we stated earlier, they are pridefulness and him being led by his sexual desires. Problem is his pridefulness and his sexual desires. They have some phrases that they communicate. These phrases are this pridefulness communicates. I deserve I deserve for my life to be this way. I deserve to have that friend. I deserve to have this job. But his sexual desires being led by them communicates, I need this. I got to have this. And see, I want you to catch this. There's a bad mixture going on. If you mix I deserve and I need together, you have a deadly cocktail, which can lead to the excuse to commit to just about anything. <laughs> see, I deserve and I need are both on the tree of entitlement. And they land us in the dangerous territory of spinning the combination lock of life rather than unlocking the combination lock of life with wisdom. Please understand this very big truth today. Yes, temptations will arise, but God's strength and wisdom overcomes even our greatest temptations. Hmm. I'm going to say it again because somebody needs to be encouraged by that. God's strength and wisdom overcomes our greatest temptations. See, in all of our lives, <laughs> it's so easy to lean into our temptations. See, when we neglect our relationship with God, <laughs> that's when a void happens. And we need to fill that void. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? We will naturally attempt to fill that void with just about anything. Sometimes we fill those voids with empty desires, which fill our hearts with foolishness instead of replenishing our hearts with faith. But I want you to catch this. You can know every 66 books of the Bible, every verse in the Bible. You can read theology, study systematic theology, pastoral care, and the like. And guess what, sweetie? You're still going to be tempted. <laughs> You can know everything about the eschatology. You can know pneumatology. You could have read every book in this library and you will still be faced with temptation. You know, if Jesus was even tempted. He was tempted by Satan. And if Jesus was tempted, so will we be. However, notice what Jesus did. Jesus didn't think that he was better than the temptation. Jesus didn't even try to handle the temptation by himself. Jesus went to God. Jesus went to God's word and he sought refuge when he was tempted. The big question here is this. Will we? We are not asked to have the strength or the supernatural tactic to fight our temptations, but we are to ask God for wisdom and for strength 
to fight these grand, big temptations for us. That's wisdom. That doesn't hinder us, but it actually propels us forward. You see, godly wisdom is essential to every area of our lives. That's why we've talked about it so extensively this month. And we see throughout the Bible that when people had wisdom, they were able to conquer big things that were above them. Take Joseph in the Bible. If you don't know Joseph, go read some of Genesis. Joseph lived at a time where there was a shortage of food, but he asked God for wisdom on how to deal with this situation. And God gave Joseph wisdom and he properly navigated a famine and helped to rule all of Egypt. Take my brother David. David is a grand mistake maker. He made a bunch of them, but yet he literally never allowed his failures to keep him away from the source of wisdom, and that is God. For my girls and my females in the virtual space, you may know Abigail. If you don't know Abigail, go read 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 3. And she managed her entire household sensibly in spite of dealing with a crazy, unfriendly husband because she asked God for wisdom and God gave her wisdom to handle her challenge. But Abigail, David, and Joseph cannot compare to that of Jesus. Jesus lived a perfect life in wisdom and died on a cross for all of humanity to carry out God's wise plan of saving us now and also in eternity. Wisdom, friends, is the combination that unlocks the lock of life. It unlocks our potential. It unlocks our purpose. And this father in Proverbs chapter two, he knew this. That's why he was pointing his son Godward. He was saying, I know violence is attempting to rule you. I know you're flirting with your sexual desires, but look to God. Friends, I don't know what's tempting you. It could be that anger is over your head. It could be that <laughs> you're tempted to cheat on a test and take a shortcut. It could be that maybe racism is tempting you. It could mean that you, maybe your pridefulness is tempting you and you're thinking I'm better than somebody. Friend, you don't have to fight this temptation by yourself, but you can go to God who can give you the remedy for this and can give you wisdom that's specific for your situation. And so here is the truth. And here's the question. Will you be humble enough to ask God for help? Will you be humble enough to say, God, I need you? Because in your humility, it honors God and God relinquishes godly wisdom for you. That's my prayer, that we will look to God and stop faking like we're so strong and allow God to help us understand how to navigate our temptations with wisdom. So together, our together takeaway is this. Godly wisdom is the panacea for all of life's greatest temptations. Panacea is the remedy it's the treatment of the disease of all of our life's greatest temptations. So friends, you may be watching this and you may say, well, I heard that father talk to his son, but maybe you're tempted by unbelief. Maybe it's so much going on in the world that you're like, man, can I really hope in Jesus? And I wanna tell you that you can. You can hope in Jesus. Jesus died that he would be our living hope and that we could cling to that hope every day. But if you have questions about the faith, questions about this hope, feel free to email us. Perhaps you're watching in this virtual space and you're saying, man, I really want to accept Jesus, but I don't know how. If that's you, I want you right now to know that you can accept Jesus all you have to do is repeat a prayer right after me. If you're ready, we're ready. Let's pray. Gracious God, I admit that I'm a sinner in need of God's love. I believe that Jesus died for me and I confess that Christ is the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, whether you have questions, whether you have just prayed this prayer of salvation or you have any 
prayer request. I need you right now, whenever you can, email us at altogether at spdl.org. Friends, we love coming into this virtual space with you. And we just, if in case God leads you to want to give a gift financially, you can do so by going to spdl.org. The giving option is there and under the drop down menu, you can indicate that you're giving a great gift to all together. Friends, I want you to know and be reminded of this fact from Proverbs 2, that godly wisdom is the panacea for all of our greatest temptations. So friends, trust in Christ, apply God's wisdom, and embrace diversity wherever you may find yourself this week. It's been great, and I hope that you have an amazing week.